Thank you all for joining us here today. I'm Acting ICE Director P.J. Lechleitner. I'm here with Enforcement and Removal Operations, or ERO, Deputy Executive Associate Director Russ Hott, who oversees ERO field offices in more than 200 domestic locations and 30 foreign locations, as well as headquarters. Today I'm very pleased to announce the results of a 12-day ERO operation targeting non-citizens who have been convicted of either drug trafficking offenses or multiple drug possession offenses involving methamphetamine, fentanyl, cocaine, heroin, or synthetic drugs. Many of the people arrested during this operation <clears throat> have final orders of removal, which means that once they're in ERO custody, we can remove them to their home countries. This significant nationwide operation ran from March 11 through March 22, covering 25 areas of operation across the U.S., from Boston to Seattle, including our nation's capital right here. This operation enabled us to do what ERO was created to do, and that is focus on smart, effective immigration enforcement to protect our homeland by arresting and removing people who undermine public safety and violate the integrity of our immigration laws. The ICE National Criminal Analysis and Targeting Center identified 419 non-citizens who are subject to law enforcement action during this operation. Some of the people we arrested include a 44-year-old citizen of Mexico who was arrested in New Jersey and was convicted of money laundering, narcotics conspiracy, felony distribution and possession with intent to distrib distribute heroin and possession or use of a firearm in, related to drug in relation to drug trafficking. We also arrested a 34-year-old citizen of El Salvador in Cincinnati who was convicted of felony conspiracy to possess with the intent to distrib distribute fentanyl. And in Orlando, ERO officers arrested a 32-year-old citizen of India who was convicted of trafficking oxycodone and felony possession of a controlled substance with intent to sell or deliver. Again, this operation resulted in a total of 216 arrests, pretty significant, all connected to the terrible drug ep epidemic that's sweeping our country. The fact is that according to the Centers for, Di for Disease Control, there were almost 110,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States during fiscal year 2023 alone. So we're on a mission to protect the American public by detaining and removing people who contribute to this horrible drug crisis. And that's exactly what this is. It's a crisis. Although our resources are stretched thin and we struggle to get the funding we need, we remain focused on targeting non-citizens who threaten the public safety of our communities. During operations like this, and any time ERO arrests a non-citizen, a sworn law enforcement officer determines whether that non-citizen should be placed in detention. Our officers look at a lot of factors when they make this determination, including whether the person has a criminal record, what their immigration history is, whether they have ties to the community, such as a job or a family, whether they're a flight risk, whether they're a parent or guardian of a child or incapacitated adult, and most importantly, whether they pose a threat to public safety. Sometimes we are required to, by law to detain certain people regardless of these factors. But let me be clear, there are inherent risks to chasing down and arresting potentially dangerous non-citizens in our communities. When we find out a removable non-citizen is in police custody, we issue what's called an immigration detainer. Immigration detainers are our way of asking state, local, or tribal law enforcement agencies to let us know ahead of time when they're going to release a removable non-citizen. This way, our officers can arrest the removable non-citizen in a safe and controlled setting. We do this to protect the American public because the fact is that we have to arrest someone who's at large in the community. It's inherently more dangerous. It's dangerous for our officers. It's dangerous for the non-citizen who's running from justice, and it's dangerous for the innocent people in our communities. We always hope that law enforcement agencies will honor our detainers so we can pick up potentially dangerous non-citizens before they're released into our communities. And to be frank, in some areas, there are laws that affect the ability for state and local law enforcement to cooperate with ICE. So we're trying to make progress in areas that are a little less ICE friendly. The bottom line is that our local law enforcement partners is like, like our local law enforcement partners, all we want to do is keep the American public safe. Although we're always mission ready and capable of conducting large scale operations like this one, it's better all around when law enforcement agencies honor our detainers to keep people like the 216 arrested in this operation off our streets. But again, 
I'm very pleased to be able to share the results here today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Russ Hott, our Deputy Executive Associate Director for ERO, who can give you more specifics. Russ? Good morning. Thank you, Director, and thank each of you for joining us here today. As Di Director Lechleitner referenced, ERO focused this interior enforcement uh, effort on the identification, location, and arrest of removable non-citizens having been convicted of drug trafficking and or multiple uh, convictions for drug possession related offenses involving methamphetamines, fentanyl, cocaine, heroin, and other synthetic drugs. ERO's enforcement division utilized the, the National Criminal Analysis and Targeting Division uh, and Center uh, and intelligence-driven leads uh, to identify criminal migrants involved with drug trafficking all over our nation. During this operation, as the director mentioned, we took 216 criminal migrants uh, who posed a significant danger to our communities from 28 different nationalities off our streets. The 216 migrants arrested have a combined total of 456 criminal convictions, amongst them including 85 convictions for drug trafficking. While this particular operation targeted those with drug convictions, many arrested had additional uh, serious criminal convictions, including burglary, arson, assault, kidnapping, extortion, sexual assault, and forgery. Further, 104 of the individuals arrested had previously been removed by ERO and had unlawfully re-entered the United States after the removal. The criminal migrants who have already been afforded due process and can be removed from the United States will be repatriated as quickly as possible. In fact, of the 216 arrests under this operation, 31 such individuals have already been removed from the United States by ERO. All others are pending the outcome of their immigration removal proceedings. I'd like to note that every time ERO arrests someone who's at large in our communities, it places undue risk on our law enforcement officers as well as the general public, as we never know how a person will react when encountered. Although ERO tries to minimize such risk by issuing immigration detainers, the fact is that some cities and localities have policies in place that prevent them from cooperating with us. We're making headway in several communities, as the director mentioned, and we'll continue to work to help preserve public safety in any way we can. This operation reflects the Herculean efforts that ERO officers make each and every day to promote public safety, to rid our neighborhoods of the scourge of perilous drugs, and to disrupt the transnational criminal enterprises that prey on our communities through the introduction of fentanyl and other dangerous drugs. I do want to thank the selfless, brave, and hardworking ERO officers who put in countless hours to ensure we located these 216 criminals hiding in our communities and who will continue efforts uh, to remove these individuals. With that said, I believe the director and I are happy to take a few questions. Thanks, Russ. Yeah, uh, we're ready for a few questions, so uh, if anybody has anything. Uh, thank you for holding this. Um, uh, one, one of the reasons we hear for uh, the reason why these policies are in place that prevent local and federal cooperation uh, is that there's concern that cooperating with ICE will chill the community and prevent the reporting of crimes. Can you talk about how you try to strike that balance with immigrant communities where, you, where that, there, that there is that concern? but you also need to do your job in arresting on citizens. Yeah, absolutely. I try. I'll give it a shot at least. Hopefully uh, we'll get to it. Um, I, I think it is, it's a balancing act. And I think some of the, the, uh, the non-citizens that are coming from areas where they're not necessarily as comfortable with law enforcement and authorities and police. Uh, so I think there's, there's a genuine, there's a, there's a kernel of truth to that. Uh, and we try to get through that from the standpoint that we're just a law enforcement agency, public safety, national security. We're just, you know, we're effectuating our mission, carrying out the law. And uh, I know every local, you know, jurisdiction, the jurisdictions that get into this, 
Um, they have their own rationale, and you know I can't speak to individual jurisdictions that do this. All, all we want to say is that we want to talk to them, and we want to try and work through on any way we can cooperate with our law enforcement partners, because that's what we are. We're just a law enforcement agency, and we want to cooperate, and we want to sit down and have dialogue to see what we can do to make it safer for the, uh, for the public. So we're, the arrests we're talking about today, were these all at-large arrests? These were all out larger. Okay. And you, you mentioned that 419 non-citizens were identified in the operation? Uh, that was the original target pool, correct. Gotcha. And so what, but 200 or, and some were... 216 were, were eventually apprehended. Gotcha. So what, what's become of the, the difference there? Uh, so the other, we had a, you know, an operation that lasted a finite portion of time. So of the original target population, the 216 were apprehended, and the other individuals will still be looked at, and we'll apprehend them eventually. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Thank you for doing this. It's Michelle with the Wall Street Journal. It's a pleasure meeting you. Uh, you too. <laughs> Um, do you want me to hold the mic? Thanks. <laughs> um, can you speak to the strategy of why you guys decide to do certain operations in quick succession as opposed to, you know, the, the people that you've apprehended in this 11-day um, operation seem to be the same people that you say are, are always ISIS top targets? Can you speak to sort of how you think about that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'll let Russ come up and talk to this because this is directly in line with the ERO uh, wheelhouse here. So, Russ? Thank you, sir. Um, that's a great question. What I would say ultimately is that uh, when, when ERO plans out its operations, right, uh, it looks at uh, emerging threat patterns and trends. As a law enforcement agency, our priority is always looking at the uh, national security, public safety, and border security uh, here in the United States. Uh, all of these operations are, are, like I said, driven by a threat stream that we see. And uh, as the director mentioned, we've seen nearly 110,000 uh, drug-related overdose deaths uh, in the last year. And that's something that uh, ERO uh, does day in and day out. But in this particular operation, based on, on some of those trends and, and threat patterns, uh, we felt that uh, this, this would uh, definitely promote public safety in, in the sphere we're operating right now. Sorry. Hey, thanks, thanks for doing this. Rob Laguerre with CBS. Thanks. Uh, nice meeting you. Uh, nice to meet you as well. Um, so there was that delta of about 200 uh, that are still uh, at large. Uh, was, was that target point, was, did, did the operation not meet that target point in part because some principalities were not willing to engage with you in the ways that you, that you discussed earlier in terms of, you know, not being able to engage with the, with the folks that you were looking for? Not, no, not necessarily. So, I mean, when you have the original starting point, these are at large individuals out there. You have to do a lot of legwork trying to figure out where they're at. There's a lot of uh, criminal intelligence that goes into this. And quite frankly, we have a very high, <clears throat> a very high portion of, the, of those individuals that we did apprehend. It's a very, actually very successful operation given the time frame. So sometimes it takes a long time to find out where someone's at because they move around. Uh, they don't have a lot of exposure on you know, the various you know, sources of information. It's hard to determine where they're at. Uh, so it just takes time. So there's a lot of nuance to, you know, why, but the per percentage that we have is, it's, it's almost, you know, 50%, if not 50%, I think, uh, was very good in that given time period. So uh, there's a lot of variables that go into why, you know, you, you can pick some people up. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. Sometimes you just get lucky as well as a cop. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's, it's really good gumshoe. Um, work that goes into identifying where these individuals are, you know, and you know, all sources and law enforcement partners as possible, and just trying to wrap them up. Got it. And then to follow up, and then one off topic, if you'd indulge me, follow up the time frame there. How do you just speak just for our edification? How do you set that time frame then? So you know, this was a what two week, three week period of, for the operation, it's like twelve days. Yeah. So how does that? How do you? How do you come to that determination that we're going to do this for twelve days? Well, there's a lot of variables with that, and uh, I will let uh, Russ come up here specifically to, to opine as well. But quite quite honestly, it's a resource allocation in some ways. Listen, we cannot do everything all the time, so we we target and we go after certain you know sets of individuals so that we focus on them and we get our act together and go and, and you can't sprint 
for the whole race. So you sprint, you do it, and then you reassess. Uh, so some of it is just reallocate, resource allocation and how we can best do that, but I'll let Russ opine on anything particular. So we'll say, uh, as the director mentioned, right, uh, we have a finite amount of resources. Um, but moreover, when we look at these, we, we kind of evaluate the target pool overall and kind of uh, the, the sphere that entails uh, and make some judgment calls based on, you know, the, uh, the background and legwork. Um, leading up to an operation, even though the operation itself uh, was limited to 12 days, right? There's a tremendous amount of effort behind the scenes uh, on the investigation side, right? Uh, identifying, locating those individuals uh, is, is a labor-intensive process for sure. Uh, but the 12 days uh, we focus in on, uh, like I said, to make sure that uh, uh, as we move from uh, the different uh, focuses in the mission space, uh, that uh, we, we have the capability, you, you know, we, we're focusing today to talk about the, the enforcement uh, and the at-large side of everything, uh, but our workforce also manages all of these cases through the entire life cycle. So those individuals who are going through uh, the immigration proceedings, uh, those individuals who are ordered removed, um, our folks are also doing that on the back end. Uh, and so kind of timing these things to make sure that we can account both for the front end and the back end is, is kind of the, the planning that goes into that. But uh, I think this ties in to the earlier question as well. You know, with the uh, Delta, uh, for us, a 50% uh, arrest rate is, is very significant. We usually expect uh, much lower percentages uh, when we're looking at this. But those individuals uh, and our interest in them doesn't stop here today, right? We'll continue our efforts uh, to locate those individuals and, and uh, bring them into our custody. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. And then just one off-topic question. Uh, you're the first uh, DHS official to speak to us since some um, events uh, took place in, Lo in Los Angeles and Miami related to the rapper uh, Sean Combs and HSI's investigation. I don't know if you can speak publicly at all to that in any way. Well, hey, I'm a lifelong cop. It's an ongoing invest investigation. really can't speak to it, unfortunately. I'd like to, like to be able, and at, at the due course and at the appropriate time, we'll be happy to, to speak about it. But it's an ongoing investigation, and I can't compromise the integrity of the investigation. Thank you. You're welcome. Folks, I really appreciate you coming. Um, we're going to keep these up, keep uh, keep the press conferences going, and keep the questions coming. So uh, we like the dialogue. So thank you very much.